Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A little later, we're gonna be talking about the cultural and scientific district tax again. But first, how do papers make their decisions on all these ballot measures and candidates? The editorial editors from the two largest papers in Colorado from the Denver Post, Chuck Pluckett, good to see you. Nice to be here. And from the Gazette, Wayne Logason, good to see you again. Thank you, good to be here. All right. So. Uh, Oh, I wanted to rip into you on something you'd got, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> let, 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 me, let, let me go for the, the first one. I mean, we look, when we're in politics, we open the papers every day or now we go online because we're really curious what, what you guys have to say. And, you know, pitching an editorial board on an issue or a candidate is, is a big deal. Let me get start over here. How does the Post make its decision when it comes to, uh, let, let's go with initiatives first or ballot measures. I mean, is it, is it a done deal, or do you actually listen to the folks who, who come up and complain to you? It's absolutely not a done deal. Um, sometimes you might even think that you as a single human being know where you are on an issue until you start finding out more about it. And um, same with the board. It's a board is like an entity with different points of view, uh, and then it has to make up its mind. So what we try to do is bring in the pro side and the con side and give them each an hour, at least. Um, if necessary, we do additional follow-up stuff uh, live in a boardroom. Then we act like reporters. You know, we dig in, we, we make calls, or we read position papers, or we read the, the, the actual you language fact of the check. bill, you fact go. check, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, so it's, you know, it's an art and a science. You've got a definite discipline that you're trying to follow. You have certain kind of questions that you feel have to be answered if you're going to be able to get to a position. There are certain um, past ways that you've talked about an issue um, or past support that you've given to an issue or a cause that you have to take into account. So you have to do that kind of research and think about those kinds of you, things. You talk about an editorial board. I, I get that there's always an editorial board. You've got different people on it. But doesn't it come down to the owner of the paper who can override the board sometimes and go, hey, that's nice. No, we're going here. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, things come out of papers that doesn't make, really always make sense. Does the owner have a lot of sway in this, or is, is there a veto power? How often does that happen? He, your, your publisher, your owner, clearly has as much say as he or she wants to have. Um, different papers handle that different ways. I like to think of it, and, and this might be a bit apocryphal or mythic, but I like to think of the old early days of the United States when a Ben Franklin was publishing papers or something like that. And if you're going to that much trouble to put out a newspaper, you want to be a member of the community. You want to have a voice. And because you cover the news day in and day out, that voice should be ought to be respected if you're doing a good job at it. And so long story short, if they want to step in and Bigfoot, then they have that right. But I think over time, uh, boards have gained enough status and the people that work on them are considered professionals that they get to have their view. Uh, Dean Singleton, our ch the chairman of our board, likes to tell me when he's weighing in on an issue, oh, you, you know, you're the editor, it's your decision, it's your call. You're I'm just editor. a member of the board. I'm just a member of the board, but your, so, uh, your job review is coming up next week, <laughs> but don't worry about that. Bring it down here, to the, the Gazette is, is a growing paper. How do you, you guys make the decision the same way? Is it always a board decision, or do, do you as the editorial editor just get a call it sometimes? Well, technically it's always a board decision because everything gets vetted by the board before it goes to print. Who, gets, goes to publication, who decides who's say. on the board, by the way? Is that the publisher gets to decide, you, you, and you, you're the The publisher editor. and the owners of the newspaper decide. We have a five-member board, and it consists of me and management and ownership and the publisher of the Gazette, who I answer to directly. And we, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a process we very much value and respect, and the ownership values and respects it, and I think the community does. We bring in a lot of experts to talk about issues. If it's candidates, we bring them in, especially on the big ticket races. We had, uh, we had uh, Donald Trump in for an ed board. We had Mitt Romney in for an ed board. We've been trying to get Hillary Clinton in. They keep wanting to send a surrogate. You know, I want to send Governor Hickenlooper or Michael Bennett. We had Michael <laughs> Bennett in for an hour and a half yesterday. Because uh, you need to hear Hickenlooper some more. That, that'll do it for you. <laughs> Let me ask you about that part He's of it, though. Been, Isn't there, is, is there a little bit of um, star power that goes on here that, yeah, it's cool, we're dealing with this, we're dealing with that, but every now and then Hillary walks in the door, and that, there's got to be some, that's got to be fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In, two, in 2008, I was just starting out on my first trip on the board. I was an editorial writer back then. And we had a, an audience, if you will, with John McCain. And it was pretty impressive. He came in 
with no notes, with no flax, with no attorneys, nothing, and just sat down and answered questions extemporaneously for an hour. And it was a, you do feel like, wow, this is really impressive. But um, the star power doesn't really sway you in the end. And unless I'm there. <laughs> of, 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 course. of course. All right, look, here's, here's the elephant in the room. It's got to be for, for both of you guys. That it's great. You got into this business, particularly on the editorial side, to influence people's decisions. And you know that when you write something, if it's a campaign that has any money, then one side is going to pull quotes from it. So I'm, I'm, first of all, do you write things knowing that, oh, yeah, this is going to help. They're going to pull this quote, and I hope to see this one on television. The Gazette uh, says. I've never consciously written anything for that reason. Uh, it happens all the time. We, when I first came to the Gazette in 2008, we had a different owner, and we didn't. We had a sort of a history of not doing political endorsements on candidates. We did on some issues, but not on candidates. It's actually been very good for us to get into the endorsement business because of what you just mentioned. So you'll write something glowing about a candidate who's spending millions of dollars on TV ads, and suddenly there it is. The Gazette says over and over again, and I don't mind that at all. I mean, why wouldn't we want more distribution of what it is that we vetted and thought about and talked about and debated and published? That's a good thing. It's good, it's good marketing for us, and it helps get the message out. I think it was a, one of the ads had, had people holding up little Denver Post, little kids. It must have been a tax increase. For, it's always a tax increase. And they were going to order, Denver Post, Denver Post. Yeah. You ever go, yeah, honey, honey, that was, that was yeah. me over there. You know, John, it's really hard. After I finish an editorial, I look at it, and I go, well, which, which thing are they going to leave out? <laughs> <laughs> Editorials are not as big as they used to be. All right, I, I remember when the Denver Post had a lot more circulation when we had two papers in this town. Um, and it, it, it probably because there were fewer distribution centers of, of news and opinion and, and all the rest. I think elected officials, when you guys work on a bill, for instance, they listen. I mean, they get scared when anybody writes about them. But do you feel that, that the editorials are not as powerful politically as they were a decade ago? Well, a good editorial ought to bring something to the discussion that you can't just get. It ought to bring a kind of argument that helps you articulate the sides of the issue. So that even if you don't line up exactly with the editorial board, you benefited from reading it because of the thought that went into researching it and then, and then crafting a well-reasoned argument. Um, that said, you're right. We wonder, do people really care about it that much? I think the higher up the food chain you go in terms of an important issue or a president or something like that, a lot of people feel like they want to, to make up their minds on their, on their own. This year, I think it's more difficult for some people. I know it's more difficult for some people. We ran a little online, non-scientific poll right before uh, we did our presidential endorsement, and we asked how much do endorsements uh, mean to you, how much do they mean to you, and overwhelmingly, people on that non-scientific poll said, you know, not at all. But then when our presidential endorsement dropped, it got enormous traffic, enormous traffic. Mm -hmm. really? And a lot of emails and a lot of comments from people saying, you know, you really helped me make up my mind, you really helped me see uh, the issues in a way I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, I dispute the, the, the premise that editorial endorsements are less valuable than they used to be. In fact, I think they're more valuable. I never would have thought 20 years ago that in 2016 newspaper editorials would even be around in a print version, much less mean anything. That was, that's what I anticipated. I was wrong about that. It seems every year our endorsements are more important. We oh. have people knocking our doors down trying to get in to see us so they can convince us on something. And I think one of the reasons for that is all the noise that's out there. Social media. First of all, you get a lot more distribution than you ever did before because people take this stuff and they tweet it and they share it on Facebook and whatever else, whatever other social media options they have. And um, so you're getting a lot bigger distribution, but, but it also cuts through the noise. It's something with a brand. It's something people know was vetted. It's something that has some well, credibility. Like a, good, a good housekeeping and, seal of approval? Is that yeah, exactly. It is so because they, they do know that we have a process and that if you can attribute this statement and this, uh, this approval to a known entity, it's a little different than all of the memes that are out there and just all of the tweets and everything. So I, I hope you're right because for... Guys like me who are working politics on a shoestring, you know, and, and we we'll go up against a big interest. We need somebody to give us credibility. Um, <laughs> your predecessor, you don't remember uh, uh, Sue O'Brien, uh, late great Sue O'Brien. I would go uh, into the editorial board and I would say, now Sue, just because 
I'm on one side of the issue doesn't mean the Denver Post needs to be on the opposite. <laughs> and she smiled and said, oh, John, you, you don't understand our policy. So, uh, so, I mean, In fact, they gave me that policy on pretty much my first day. <laughs> first day. Here it is on the page. Whatever John does, just, go there. This is ahead, the right? first rule of first. <laughs> um, but it, it, for a, a guy that doesn't have money when fighting an issue one way or the other, going to the editorial board is, is a sign of credibility. Yeah. Um, I mean, going back to what I was saying earlier about being a member of the community, if, if the community sees you day in and day out and knows that you're in the trenches trying to report the, the news and the stories and, and analyze how things are going on, and then you weigh in on the issue, it, it has an outsized role. And like what Wayne was talking about, it's so true. The, it, social media has made it so difficult to know what to believe and who to trust. And another factor in this is the incredible amount of money that gets spent on the ads. The candidates and the, and the issue promoters hire some of the very smartest, best people in the world into crafting messages that even highly intelligent people have trouble discerning. It takes a fair amount of work sometimes to bust uh -huh. through the five or six major claims that a 30 second TV ad that has all the neat little images and sounds and, and persuaders uh, in the background. And I wanna add something to this too. And that is uh, some editorial endorsements are more important than others. When the Denver Post endorsed Cory Gardner, that was a huge deal for that campaign because nobody saw that coming. Nobody expected the Denver Post to endorse a Republican candidate in a senatorial race. When we endorsed John Hickenlooper for his first run for office, Hickenlooper came back to us With after the election. And candy well, and he huh. came back in to, to say, we discussed some things in, in the endorsement meeting, like widening of I-25, for example. And here's what I've done already to try to get that on track. He wanted to, he was excited to tell us that, but he also wanted to tell us that when we endorsed him, it meant a lot to him because he never expected it. And he said it was the greatest day of his campaign. So these endorsements, I don't know how much value they really have, but the perceived value in campaigns is huge. They well, obsess over getting them. Let's just take a case in point. Uh, Proposition 106, which is uh, uh, assisted suicide or dignity with dying, depending on how you want to do it. The Post came out against this. Uh, and that was, that was a shock to me. Uh, it must have been a hell of a fight because you guys have traditionally been in favor of some sort of assisted, assisted suicide, death with dignity, however you want to put it. That's how, been, how big is that fight? That was a big, big discussion. Big, it was never a fight. You know, I'm a, a newcomer as an, as an editor on that board, so the process was, was scary to me, but it was also fascinating and exciting to me. It's, it's how many people get to be in a dramatic position like this, where you go into it somewhat libertarian leaning, thinking, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. The chairman of your board has had MS for 30 years and has very uh, personal views about this, these issues. And then you have a publisher in Mac Tully, whose father, uh, despite his wishes uh, to, l to not be put on life support when he got to that situation, was put on life support because not every single I was dotted and T was crossed. And on Father's Day, uh, was ripping pieces of equipment out of his own body, trying to like let himself go. And so obviously, he, the publisher had very serious views. Right. And then we have a new uh, editorial board member and writer, um, Megan Schrader, who also had, everybody has right. like some connection to this and has some kind of view. And we fought it back and forth or argued about it quite a bit. Tell me about the hate mail, real fast. I mean, how, how vicious can it get? I mean, when you guys put something out, I mean, I mean, besides the stuff that I send you, what, what other stuff do you, do you get? Is, well, it, is, is it, I mean, after a while, do you, is it just a joke and it doesn't bother you, or does it? It doesn't usually bother yeah. you. Sometimes if, if somebody's really hit you on something, they're right, it can yeah. bother you. Um, I've had hate mail my entire career. Now there's a lot more hate mail, because in addition to the hate mail, you have hate tweets, you have hate blog, you know, posts yeah. on, uh, you have entire blogs set up that, about hating you sometimes. And uh, so you get a lot of that. It just goes with the territory, but it's good to pay attention to it, to, to watch it, listen to it, see if sometimes, a lot of times these people are right. You know, they're, they're you, you Have you turned were, off the comment so, section uh, under your? Uh, no. No. We, no, we allow comments under under. But I can understand why, yeah. why papers don't, because it, it gets There it are gets people insane. who get out of bed in the morning, and that's what they do. Right, and it's important that then you've got, to, the you've, got to, you've, yeah. got to, you've got to go through it all and, and rinse out all the stuff that's bad. Do you guys yeah. still do? We still do the comments, and we still have people that, are, that have to bear through that and like yeah. deal with the, the crazies. I was going to say about hate mail that it's different on the editorial board than it was when I was in the newsroom. Um, a, there are still the hate, just the pure hate mail. Yeah. The, you know, 
well, I won't use the language on TV, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's vivid. I want to hear it. <laughs> if it's good enough but, for Trump, it's good enough for us. But we get a lot of really intelligent responses. Yeah. People who obviously think, okay, I want to make an argument that tries to match the argument that was presented, and they'll point by point go through and say, this is why I disagree with that, and this is why mm -hmm. I disagree with that, or this is why I line, where I line up with you on that. So it's, it can be really gratifying a lot of the times, too. In fact, um, I think the majority of my mail has been more gratifying than not. All right, l last question we've got to run, but let's, let's talk about the presidential um, picks. You guys went out and said, vote for Hillary. That's I right. was shocked, I tell you, shocked, like Claude Rains and, and Casablanca, shocked to find gambling in this establishment. <laughs> um, and ha have you guys made the, the choice we've yet? We've not made a decision yet. We're struggling with it. We're trying to get Hillary in. And I, you know, we've, we've extended the invitation many times and never got, we've never had a no. Uh, we also yeah. haven't had the invitation accepted. And we've been offered, like I say, a number of surrogates. But we're, we're still working on this one. It's tough. Come on. Don't know what we're going to do. Come on. We'll, now you, <laughs> you'll know when we decide. How close were you to a protest vote on um, Gary Johnson? You know, there for a while we took it very seriously. About a month and a half ago, we were really talking about it. And we, we thought if we were going to do it, we would try to do it with plenty of time to actually make a difference right. and, and get people thinking. Um, but after the Aleppo comments and the world leader comments and just thinking about it a little bit more in terms of Practically, who are you going to back in a situation like this with the world in the, situa in the state that it's in? Um, we just couldn't support Donald right, Trump. I'll, that was I'll, such anathema to us that um, we, when, just, we, had, two to years hurt, we had to hurt him. And if you voted for Gary Johnson, it was going to, it was going to help him. All right. Any chance you guys are going to go for Hillary? Uh, well, there's always a chance. Come on, Everything's possible. Everything's possible. If she were to come in and, and sell it to us, you never know. So we, the, the door is open. Most candidates come to us and want to come in. Uh, you know, we were starting with Ron Paul when I first got to the Gazette and, and a long line of others. Um, for some reason, Hillary does not want to come in what to our editorial board. But we, Funny you know, we never asked me maybe, to the maybe editorial she'll change board. Her mind. We'd love to have a discussion. I got to run. Thank you, so. Okay. Chuck, thank you. Stay tuned.